can take away your sin and I remind you here today he can and he will and for those of us who have already found that joy we owe him our praise we owe him our worship Uh, praise God While you're turning to John chapter 8, I want to say thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. To any visitors that have taken the time to be with us on this summer Sunday, we are so thankful that you're here with us. We honor you. We hope you feel at home. We're thankful for what the Lord is doing. John chapter 8, we've heard from this narrative already across the campus this morning in our classes and even here in the adult class and I'd like to leave this lady alone but I can't I'd like to leave this narrative alone but I cannot so I got to talk about it just a little bit more this morning it is my humble opportunity and this church affords me the opportunity to preach not only here, but to travel and preach in other districts, other states, camp meetings, conventions. In fact, I get to go, Brother Kilman, you and I will be partnered before long, somewhere, maybe, maybe more than one state, I can't remember, but I know we've got a camp together. And, but Kilman, I was praying this week and seeking God And the Lord spoke something very humbling to me. He had to speak something to me that stirred me. I was in a public place later in the day and I began to reflect and I found myself crying in public. The Lord was searching my heart and speaking to me and so felt Him impress upon me these words, my, my people have unintentionally replaced their wonder for me with evaluation of the church. So I've come to this service today to do my best as his servant and your pastor to remind you that he is still wonderful. When the service is good and when the service is not. When the song is good and when the song is not. When the harmony is right and when the harmony is wrong. Lord, we are in wonder. We are in awe of you. We refuse to take you for granted. If you believe that and you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. It is in John 8, I would read to you verses 6, 7, and 8. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. It was less about the woman and more about Jesus. The enemy's real reason he wants to destroy your life is because he hates God. Jesus stooped down. Everyone say he stooped down. And with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. I bet that annoyed them. 
So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. He stood up and he said unto them, those words that Brother Lopez, you taught so well in our first hour, he that is without sin among you, let him cast, first cast a stone at her. Verse 8 says, after he said that, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I want to preach for just a little while on this thought. Again, he stooped down. Again, he stooped down. Lord, we love you and we feel your presence in this house. It seems like every song has been woven together that we might be in amazement of you. I pray this atmosphere would be filled with the glory of God. Touch every mind, touch every heart. Help our mouths to respond with what is lodged in our heart. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We give you thanks and praise. And let everyone say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Turn to two or three people and tell them again he stooped down. The picture you will see on the screen behind me is not overlaid with a filter other than a natural filter. It is the orange haze that is gathered over New York City. This this orange haze is, yes, something that people are speaking of in regards to pollution and there is smog and there is Pollen, but that's not what this is. Many of you watching and reading the news are aware that what is being seen in this imagery, in fact, just the other day, it continued to be remarked about while the Yankees were trying to play because of the orange smog that was in the air. Take a good look at that picture. I I don't want to use someone else's distress for a mere throwaway illustration. In fact, I was very uh, sensitive to whether or not I would even use this, but it paints such a good image for what I want to convey. I would ask that you would receive this in the way that I intended. The haze that is there over New York is not because of what's taking place in New York. There might be some atmosphere issues that make it more conducive, but many of you know, looking at that from reading and watching and This haze is because of the wildfires that are taking place in Canada. Some grave distance away, the fire that started somewhere else is affecting the air many miles away. We have individuals in this very church that are more sensitive to air than others. Some of you are Where are my allergy sufferers? Would you raise your hand right now? Yeah. Some of you are feeling this in a different way. Some in this room have different issues with lungs and conditions that the air, it's much more sensitive to them. Has anybody in the last week got an alert on your phone that's talking about air condition hurting the ability to breathe? Many of us that that does not affect have gotten that. It's because of the effects that are in the air, sometimes so microscopic that they cannot be seen with the naked eye, with the human eye, without the use of microscopes, without the use of certain technology, but they are filling the air. And if we could see them at the most microscopic level before the haze has filled the atmosphere, then we would be able to process what really is going on. I would tell you that New York is seeing that orange haze and they are beginning to visualize what was already there before they could see it visually. It had to get to a certain amount of toxicity, if you will, and overtake the atmosphere in such a way that it finally became visible what they were already breathing in. I would tell you that while we might not be able to see it in this room today, I wish that we could because there is very much something in the atmosphere that is in combat, if you will. It is the 
atmosphere of God's glory that is trying to work against the atmosphere that is against God's glory. There is what I would even refer to from the narrative of John chapter 8. There is a battle of condemnation against that of conviction. There is the opportunity that, that, that there would be a conviction settle in and thankfully by the end of this particular narrative we are watching these individuals who are so hard hearted that they even begin to experience conviction. Let me take a preacher's pause here at the beginning and remind us nobody should be considered so far gone that the conviction could not touch them and begin to do a work in their life. But I will tell you that the right atmosphere helps and the wrong atmosphere hurts. I'll say it again, as simple as it is. The right atmosphere helps and the wrong atmosphere hurts. It is not false that she was caught for she seems to open not her mouth but it is also not false that if she were caught in the act of adultery, that there was a man that was to blame as well. I'm going to say a statement right now that many of us will not like and we do not want to associate with, but I've waited until everyone is in here, from the youngest to the eldest for this point to be made. In this narrative of John chapter 8, there is a man that has sinned and there is a woman that has sinned. And whether we like it or not, we better put ourselves in their shoes. Because although we might have been in church for some time now, and maybe it's been decades since you were washed and filled with His Spirit, I will remind every one of us here that we were sinners on our way to hell. And had it not been for the grace and the mercy of God that stepped in, oh yes, that stepped in and, and was that, that uh against the adversary of our soul and against our life, then we would not be here today. They drug this woman ready to accuse her. And we watch something in the posture of Christ that seems equally as unimpressive to the Pharisees as his everyday action. They are not wanting him to defend this woman, much less are they wanting him to get down to a lowly posture and get down into the dirt and get his hands dirty. Pardon this if you will, but in order to emulate Christ, there are times we must get our hands dirty. We get down into situations like this and I've preached about it. You've heard it before. You've taught Bible studies on it. We've all been in this narrative. What was he doing? What was he writing? What was he saying? How? And I've heard every preacher preach it every other way and I've tried to exhaust it, but I've never been so captured as I have been this week in prayer and study based on what the Lord was touching my heart with as much as I wondered when he put his hands in the dirt that day, when he put his hands in the dust that day. Now, I've got to tell you, I believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. I I believe that he really was God on earth in human form. I believe that Jesus Christ was God walking among us, the invisible made visible. I really believe, therefore, that when Jesus got down in the dust that day and he began to run his fingers through the soil, my, my mind has gone. Did he not feel himself remembering what it was like to form Adam out of the very dust of the earth and understood he's always been good at making something out of what seemed like nothing. Was she dirty? Sure she was dirty. Was she a woman of ill repute? Yes she was. Was there sin in her life? Absolutely. But he knew he had formed mankind from dirt once And I must be honest if I do a true and a humble evaluation of myself and I consider where I could be and where I would be and even if I'd be honest and tell you where I should be, I'm thankful that he got his hands dirty with me. I know you might be a preacher here today. I I know you might have talked in tongues for the first time 50 years ago, but I would remind you here today, there was a time he had to get down to the dirty. 
And when people in your life and people in your family and people that you knew were looking at you, they were holding the stone. Aren't you glad he got his hands dirty with you? Uh Uh-huh. He got his hands, he got his hands dirty before he got his hands pierced. The same hands that were going to hold those spikes, they held dust first. They held dirt first and and they understood, here they've brought this woman to die to make me look bad. Study the scripture, that's what was happening. They brought this woman so that she might die, so that he might be accused. But Jesus is sitting there playing in the dirt, actually knowing, I came to die so that you wouldn't have to. I didn't come here for you to die for me. I, I came here to die for you. I came here to walk to Calvary, that cross that I preached about last week, so that you could be better than you were. He never had a desire to leave her in her sin. For anybody that thinks, man, that's easy believism. No, this is the book. He was going to tell her in a handful of verses, go and, go and, one more time, everybody, go and, And we don't believe that we're supposed to stay in sin, that grace may abound. God forbid. But we better walk back down the ragged path to the dirty moment where he found us every now and then and remember if it was not for the grace of God. Let me remind you of some scriptures today. Paul would write it in the very in the cesspool of sin at Rome. And he would say, where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. I'm just going to preach the grace of God for a moment. I am in awe of the grace of God. I don't deserve a seat on this pew. I don't deserve a seat in this sanctuary. I don't deserve to have a nice suit. I don't deserve to have a nice tie. I don't deserve to have my right mind. Come on, where are my real people at? Where are my real people? You don't deserve to have a a mind that can think clear or a spirit that can be in. I'm gonna say something only because I feel like I can. Only because I feel like I can. We got this 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock service and everybody's been so sweet. It's the only reason I can say anything. But our biggest concern was where are we going to put the young people? Pastor Lopez, you gave so much agonizing thought to who are we going to offend if we move their seat. I'm not taking, listen, listen, nobody came to me offended so I get to say it. Had one person laugh with me and I laughed with them. I'm thankful they had such a beautiful spirit. But you, how many people agonized about where do we put them because what happens if? Okay. (laughs) Ready? I can't believe I even get a seat in the church. (laughs) Brother Kilman, I preach it every way I know how. And I find myself back at the foot of the cross. He found me. He picked me up. He turned me around. They wanted to kill me. They wanted to destroy me. They wanted to eliminate. And it was not a group of guys. It was Satan himself. If we're not careful, can I parallel this stone for you for a second? If we're not, you still got that big old stone? Hold it up. That's dangerous. Throw it. (laughs) Throw it. It's heavy. (laughs) If we're not careful, ooh, don't lay it on that nice. God forbid we scratch it. Just trying to make some people nervous. God forbid 
We go back to Psalm 118, 22. And we remember the stone that the builders refused or rejected is become the headstone of the corner. You want to read about it? Read about it over and over in the Gospels. He's called the chief cornerstone. And if we're not careful, it's not the world holding stones against us. It's us using Christ as the stone against us. You get good and then you can get God. Sometimes we forget it was us in the middle of the circle. Sometimes we forget we were the ones on our hands and knees and we were the ones that didn't deserve this and we get a little bit of righteousness and self right. Oh, you are ought to be better than that. Christ. Anytime we begin to use Christ as a weapon against someone, Boy, that's good preaching. There were a lot of nervous woes, but that's. He is not to be used. You better watch out or God's going to get you. How dare you show up like that? How are they supposed to? We caught them in the act. What you gonna do now, Jesus? Here, here, Jesus. What you gonna do now? And Jesus puts on the personality for them to understand. Here's what he does. Oh, if you're gonna take her down, I'll go ahead and get down here by her. <laughs> I know you, I know you think you're high and mighty. Starts. I would love to know what he, I would love to know what he wrote. I know some of you think you know what he wrote. I know what he wrote. (laughs) He wrote their sin. I know you heard someone preach that one time. But he stood up. All right, this is where we get. This is it. And if I'm in the crowd and I'm holding. (laughs) All right, here it is. What are you going to say? Let the one of you first cast that has no has no sin. His presence and his word should cause us introspection. That's the beauty of coming together in the house of God and getting in his presence because being in his presence can take the hardest of hearts and bring conviction. If you're here today, I want you to hear me. If you're here today and your natural tendency has become to be a judgmental person, I wish you'd put your stone on the ground. I wish you'd put your tongue of judgment on the altar. Oh, pastor, the Bible says we got to know them that labor among We do. First person you need to know is you. I bet I'm not the only one who knows I shouldn't be here. I'm going on record in front of all these beautiful congregants. And Lord, I'm telling you, I know I didn't deserve your mercy. I know I didn't deserve your mercy. But instead of stones getting cast at me, I found a stone that I can stand on. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you have been so used to people holding stones, ready to cast at you, that it has become your own ideology that now that you're a part of the body, now you, I want to fit in, so I'll cast stones. I want you to hear me. That's not the kind of church this is going to be. Not if it's going to be his church. Come on, not if it's going to be his church. We're never going to preach that sin is okay. We're always going to preach go and sin no more. But we're not going to pick up stones ready to... Can you believe... 
I need people that remember who you used to be. I'm telling you, God is watching right now. I need people that remember who you used to be to rise to your feet and say, no, 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 no. I don't want to cast stones. I want to stand on the stone. I want to stand on that sure foundation, which is Christ and him crucified. I want you to stand with me in this house. Woo. Again, he said it, and again. He stooped down. Let me ask you a question. How many times has he had to stoop for you? I wouldn't want anybody to know how many times he's... I feel a little conviction now just said... Condemnation is bad. The Bible even tells us later in 1 John that your heart can condemn you. You can get to a place, you're, you can let this flesh get so overwhelmed, so overrun. You walk into church, somebody drag you in here, and you'll feel like, I don't have a chance. Even I have given up on me. It seems to paint the picture that this little girl, this lady in this story, it seems to paint the picture that she never could even look. Please catch this before I'm done. It's not until that final question when Jesus looks at her brother Barkus and says, there's no man condemning you. What, 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 what's going on here? And it seems as if you see her kind of... And the work could not be completed until she spoke with her mouth. Said no man. God forbid that anyone would show up and they're so scared to make eye contact with. I want it to go across the airways and I want it to permeate this atmosphere because I think it's a part of the glory of God. Everyone, everyone. Everyone deserves the chance to experience the mercy, the grace. Pastor, I want you to preach it hard. We are. We're going to preach against sin. And if we're not careful, we say, you got you to hate the sin, but you got to love the sinner. I agree with that, but really what you've got to hate is the sin that tries to destroy your own life. i got to be careful that I don't see what someone's doing and decide that I'm going to use the chief cornerstone as a weapon. Because if I really follow his posture, I'll find myself stooping to get down to where they are. If you're in this room today and condemnation has been telling you you don't have a chance, I'm here to tell you that's a lie from hell. If you're here today and you want your wonder of God to be renewed, you just want to be in awe of Him again. You just want to be back in that story where he found you. I'm preaching to some people right now that when he found you, you were just a child that got drugged into a revival. And you didn't, even, you didn't even know what was going on, but you were there. And all of a sudden, you felt warm, salty tears. I need somebody to lift their hands and travel back with me. Oh, I feel the presence of God.
would you begin some soul searching with me in this room? Would somebody honestly ask God, am I still in awe of you? Because regardless of whether you're a first time visitor or our most seasoned member in the room, we should still be in awe of the presence of God. Jesus, search my heart. Jesus, search. If I've if I've had some self-righteousness, I need you to stoop down again. <laughs> if I've somehow made my evaluation of you based on my evaluation of the church, I need you to forgive me. I'm in awe of you. I've got a little bit of a unique call today. I'd like to start this altar call by asking anybody that's just feeling a little bit overwhelmed when you remember how he found you. Because I'm one of those people that was raised in the church. I was raised. I was I was raised to serve God and yet still I've got this marked night where I remember when he f and I think really what it is is that that's when I found him he knew where I was but it's like it was the fook. all these decades later when I go back and I remember the night that I noticed he stooped down it changed everything for me. And he's had to stoop down a lot of times since then. But when I look back, so out of that, out of that moment, I think we have people that are going to be baptized here in a moment. It's a beautiful thing. If you've never been baptized, it is the result of the preaching of the cross, Christ and Him crucified. We are buried with Him in baptism. We receive new life in Him because He stooped down, I repent. Because He stooped down, I was baptized. Because He stooped down is the only reason I've been filled. And as he so convicted my heart that my people have unintentionally replaced their wonder of me with evaluation of the church. You don't have to, but if you're comfortable and you would, I wonder if there's somebody that step out of your pew and just walk to the front and say, God, I'm in awe of you. I don't know that I've really thought about it in a while, but you took my sin. I'm not sure if I've just thanked you purely for this in a while, but thank you for stooping down. I don't know if I have in a little while, but I just need to say thank you when the accusations had risen against me. You might be in this house and you've never taken a moment like this, but you feel something drawing you either right where you are or by walking to the front, getting as close as you can. I would encourage you to say, God, forgive me if there's anything wrong in my heart, my mind, anything not pleasing to you. I want to turn. I want to repent. I want to turn from it. Come on, I know you... You love to study theology. You, you love to consider the intricacies of His Word. Ooh. Oh. Grace. 
Mercy. Oh. Come on, pour your heart out. It'll turn just into thanksgiving. It'll just turn into thanksgiving. When they wanted their stones to kill you, the chief cornerstone stepped in and saved you. Oh, let's lift our voices all over, all over, all over the room. Lift them loud. Once you begin to thanks, come on, give that thanks. It ought to be like you take the lid off and it just pours. Thank you for finding me. Thank you for redeeming. The wages of sin were going to be death. Ah, but you've given me the gift of God through eternity. 